Welcome to the Report Card with Nat Malkus. On the Report Card, we evaluate research, policy, and practice efforts to improve the lives of families, schools, and students. Now, when we think of education reform, policymakers and philanthropists often focus on urban areas or maybe suburbs, but too often give short shrift to rural schools. However, rural schools educate about a fifth of American students, and they have unique strengths and challenges that won't necessarily be addressed by applying the reforms in urban and suburban environments. So today we're going to talk about rural education, and I brought on two excellent guests to talk with me about it. Jeff Hawkins is the executive director of the Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative, which I'll let him explain in a moment. And I also asked Campbell Scribner, who's a historian and assistant professor of education at the University of Maryland, to come on the podcast. Fellas, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. Thank you. All right. So start out, let's talk a little bit about the what and the why. On the what, I do a lot of statistics, and statistical agencies will tell you what is rural, right? And they usually do this by saying, well, this is urban, and this is suburban, and whatever is not in those buckets, well, that's rural, which seems like a pretty bad way to <laughs> define anything, you know, by whatever is left over. So help us get beyond that sort of thinking, that sort of flyover conception of rural schools. What would you point as the hallmarks of rural schools and education? And what are some of the key distinctions that do separate them from their suburban and urban counterparts? Jeff Hawkins, can you answer that first? I'll give it a whack. I think one of the things that we look at in distinguishing rural from other is population density. Where we are, our organization represents an area that's a little bigger than the state of Connecticut. And we serve within that area about 50,000 kids. So distance to and from resources, that really contributes to what rural is. We also have to imagine that there are different kinds of rurality. We are in southern Appalachia. Nebraska is much different in terrain, much different employment opportunities. So all over the country, there are different types of rurality. Right. And if you just name a few, you can conjure these images, right? Like the High Plains Desert. Rural, <laughs> real different from Appalachia, real different from South Dakota, New Hampshire. Yeah. So rural really captures a great variety. I guess I would just add the, the economics of it. Although there are rural areas that are now bedroom communities where people commute two hours to get to D.C. or New York. And some rural areas are based on tourist economies. I would still think that most rural areas are some sort of productive or extractive economy, not just farms, of course, but also mining, also timber. I mean, there, there are lots of different kinds, and I think it speaks to that diversity. But when we think about the role that schools are supposed to play, either preparing people for the job force or even just what people are willing to pay for schools, it's a little bit different if you're looking at upper middle class suburbanites versus, you know, poor farmers who need to hold on to the family farm or, you know, are not making much as coal miners. What people are willing to pay and what they expect schools to do for them, their kids and their community, I think differs quite substantially from other communities. Yeah. And certainly the economies that those school systems might be tailored to are going to vary vastly compared to suburban and, and urban centers. Campbell, you're a historian at University of Maryland. So Go Terps, by the way. I, I'm a graduate. But I think the image of early American schools you know, often centers on this rural school idea, right? It's, it's sort of the one room schoolhouse thing. We, we like that. But of course, urbanization, modernization have sort of made, has definitely made the one room schoolhouse a relic of the past. But I think urban schools have left sort of an indelible mark on how we generally think about public education. What are some of those indelible marks that have remained? I was actually at a conference two weeks ago of one-room school enthusiasts, you know, historians, people who, who preserve these buildings and who run local historical societies. And I had a woman there who asked me sort of for ammunition, where she had been getting criticism from colleagues that she was sort of a romanticist or a nostalgist, and that, that her interest in one-room schools was sort of simplistic and, and overly rosy, I, I suppose. I think that what I told her actually is that if anything, she wasn't sort of radical enough in her nostalgia, because I think a lot of the things that one-room schools embody, whether it's local control, local democracy, experimentation with, with how we teach or who we teach, a lot of these things were present in one-room schools and still are present in many other rural areas. And they're what we'd like to think American education is at its best, right? Public participation, people showing up to school board meetings, people knowing their kids' teachers. These things in some ways are a hallmark of the past, but I think they're, they're something that should be preserved and or revived. 
And it doesn't make one a nostalgist to think that those are, are worthwhile things. They're sort of legacies that are quite usable and, and, and morally imperative in the present. Yeah, it's interesting. Betty Malin, who is one of your colleagues at Maryland and was one of my professors, told us in school that, you know, she went to a one room schoolhouse when she I think she was in North Dakota. And, you know, it's not that long ago that these are actually a factor. Today, we have rural schools that they're not one room schoolhouses, but they still face a lot of those same pressures that were were present in the one room schoolhouse idea. If I could speak maybe to how contemporary in some ways that they are, one-room schools were flourishing throughout the 19th century and reached their peak around 1920. It was at that time when cities, of course, were starting to grow, and President Theodore Roosevelt launched what he called the Country Life Commission to improve rural life for, along many dimensions. But one of these was education, and that's where the ball of consolidation started to roll. The idea was we need to close these one-room schools, make them bigger to offer more services, health care, hot lunch, whatever. And so starting in about 1920 is when you go from having over 200,000 one-room schools to, by the mid-1970s, having less than 2,000 nationwide. But in 1960, you still have 50,000 of these things operating, especially in places like Kentucky, the Upper Midwest, the Great Plains, and parts of New England. And so these are not ancient history for a lot of people. Whenever I mention one-room schools, anyone who I talk to says, oh yeah, my grandmother taught in one. My father went to one. Really, we're talking about one or two generations. And for many communities, these do remain, I think, a live wire in some ways. I know there are communities in Ohio that have not passed a tax levy to support their local public schools because they're still upset that they lost their local one-room schoolhouse back in 1970-whatever, and they're just not letting it go. And of course, I'm not condoning that necessarily, sure. but I would say that for many communities, this remains a politically important issue. Who controls the school board? Where is the school building located? Consolidation still has sort of open wounds, I think, in a lot of places. So rural schools have certainly moved by and large past the one-room schoolhouse idea. I have a question to the why. Why should we have this podcast? And so part of this, I recently contributed a chapter in this book. My friends Mike McShane and Andy Smerick edited on rural education. And I just took a statistical look at rural students' outcomes and sort of demographics and so forth. There's a lot of interesting variation. But when you look at the outcomes, they're actually pretty good. You know, I mean, they're a little below sort of suburban schools, but they're well above urban schools. They're actually above town schools if you separate them out as well. They educate about 20 percent of America's students, which is, you know, a good chunk, but not an overwhelming percentage. They're performing pretty well. As I said before, they get short shrift from the policy community, from newspapers and attention. When we think education policy, we usually are not talking about rural schools. So should we focus more on them? Obviously, as somebody who lives in a rural community, my answer would be yes. And when we think about rural schools, there are really two big universal challenges that we believe exist in rural education, scale and isolation. And for the work that we do and, and trying to work with funders, scale is a really important issue for them because they want that investment to do a lot of stuff for a lot of kids. When you are in a rural district, we have one rural district that has 402 kids, K through 12. That's all they've got. It's really difficult for a philanthropist then to say, I'm going to invest money there. Then I can tell the story of what works because scale is off. When we also think about isolation, we have this 20, 25 percent of kids in America who attend a rural school, but they're spread from coast to coast. Sure. And it's hard to find a concentrated area to be able to do a study that would determine whether or not that's going to be effective. So I think those two issues really play into lots of considerations. And I would take it a step further. When we talk about scale and isolation, it becomes more difficult than to have leadership that has a vision that is going to be sustainable over the long haul, because it's very difficult sometimes to attract really high quality teachers who are going to be there for a long time, because predominantly in our state, which is the only one I know much about, our districts have a smaller pay scale than our urban neighbors do. So our teachers teach children who arguably have more challenges from where they come from than their more citified counterparts do, but they make less money. Our teachers 
really invest in getting to know those kids, being able to provide them with hot meals, making sure that they're going to be okay, that they have a place to sleep at night. And that's part of what separates them and why their success rate is higher, because they do have that investment. But that sustainability, scale, and isolation become real determinants in how we find partnerships, either at the state, federal, or philanthropic level. So, Jeff, there's a number of things that you mentioned in there that I want to unpack. But first, let's just back up a little bit. And you, again, are the executive director of the Kentucky Valley Education Cooperative. Tell the audience, what is that and what are you trying to do? We've been around since 1969. This is our 50th year in operation. We're an educational service agency, uh, ESA. In Kentucky, we call them cooperatives. There are eight in Kentucky. Districts can join or not join if they want to. So we represent 23 rural districts in the heart of the mountains in eastern Kentucky. We go from Ohio to West Virginia to Virginia to Tennessee. And we support an investment in the human capital of our educators, our community members, and our students. We focus on personalized learning. We have divisions within our organization that only focus on special needs population kids. We work on leadership development, the use of technology to enhance education, entrepreneurialism. We believe that we need to have an impact on the ecosystem of education, K through 12, preschool through college. And that's the only way that we will really be able to reverse the trajectory of the region where we are. So the cooperative works across these districts. And some of the problems that you mentioned are problems that, by definition, rural schools are going to face. They're not in centralized population areas. That's why you're going to face problems of scale and also the challenge of isolation. You know, many districts feel this tension on gaining efficiency and scale and maintaining local control. And we mentioned consolidation. Campbell, can you give us a little bit of background on the pattern of consolidation over time at the district level? I mean, we used to have hundreds of thousands of school districts, and we're down now to under 20,000, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so it, it's complicated, basically. And to quickly sketch it out, the debate has often been what actually induces a district to consolidate over the course of the 20th century. And there have been some people who have basically said, well, it's been largely voluntary. Lots of rural parents want better sports teams or they want their kid to go to college and they think that a centralized school will get them that. And so lots of communities voluntarily seek out either sort of the voluntary cooperative districts that you're saying or interdistrict reforms that you're mentioning, Jeff, or they, they will willingly combine with the neighboring town. Other scholars, and this goes back a century, either conservatives or people on, on the far left would actually say, no, this is a government reform being imposed very unwillingly on local districts who are being coerced into consolidation. Both sides are actually right. It sort of depends where you go. Some towns very willingly consolidate and others do it fighting tooth and nail and only consolidate when the state basically says, we're going to strip you of any funding if you don't, or we're going to force you to close your building if you don't. And so over the course of the 20th century, there's this very uneven pattern of sort of carrots and sticks where districts are trying to look out after their own interests, which they judge differently. Some want to lower their taxes and think that consolidation will do that. Others very willingly pay higher taxes to maintain local control because they value their, their community, they value their local school district. And so it's this very sort of back and forth, you know, depends on the community sort of process. By the 1950s, certainly, it's tipped in one direction, which is that state departments of education have gotten big enough and powerful enough to coerce local districts. And by that time, state funding was enough of an inducement, basically, to encourage local districts to consolidate. That being said, just as Jeff mentioned, then and even up to today, states are very aware of the optics of this, and they certainly don't want to do anything forcibly. That doesn't look good. And so there are all sorts of mechanisms, again, cooperative interdistrict structures, which will allow districts to pool their resources or have some sort of centralized administration without giving up, say, their local school building or without giving up their local school board necessarily. And so basically, it's this combination of sort of palatable, slow-term reforms that allows districts eventually to consolidate or induces them to consolidate by the 1960s and 70s. But I want to stress again that it's a very long, drawn-out process. People at the turn of the century thought it would take 10 years. It took 65. 
And in the process, again, it, it, it has left a lot of open wounds. Not everyone agrees about district consolidation. Sure. And, it, and it's still going on today. I mean, I mentioned to you so, earlier this, this story that a, a state leader told me he had these two high schools. They were just dwindling. They really needed to consolidate. They went through all the work. They were down to the dotted line. And the whole thing fell apart because they couldn't decide on which mascot to keep. Yep. And that's just the, you know, the key idea that these schools are actually part of the local community and there are real trade-offs. And of course, the slow building pressure of, wow, we're really getting small. Those don't have the point that losing your mascot can do. And, you know, that's the nature of these sort of fights. I think to, to Jeff's earlier point also, when we're thinking about educational reform, we need to sort of think of time scales. And rural schools are operating on sort of like a glacial time scale, where basically the conversation is exactly the conversation we would have been having in 1890. How can we be more efficient? What do we do given that these are huge distances with very low populations? Consolidation remains sort of the order of the day. And yet, if you look at cities, which of course are notorious for cycling through a new reform every five years or 10 years, right? It's just this flux. It was about 10 years ago that the Gates Foundation and others were pushing the notion of small schools, right. schools within schools community-based learning, et cetera, you could forgive rural communities for saying, we've been saying that for a century now. Right. We've been making all these arguments that consolidation denies us small schools. It denies us community involvement. And so I, of course, can't explain away the fact that we do have budgetary pressures. We do have distances to deal with and small populations to deal with. But as a basic model, I think there's a lot to recommend small schools and local control in rural areas, but frankly, in any area. And when you asked earlier about the, the sort of lessons or the value of rural education, I think that's probably the strongest one in my mind, is sort of a communitarian argument for schools as the bedrock for local communities and local democracy. Jeff, at the Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative, I mean, you're trying to do some of this connective tissue across districts, this intra-district work that might balance some of these pressures, enabling schools that face scale pressures to do some of the things across districts that they can't do by themselves. Can you talk about some of those efforts and how you think about them? Yeah, I can try. I can touch on some of them. There are literally hundreds because what we really make an effort to do is help people understand that school and education is a catalytic driver to reinvent the future. And that reframes the narrative about what being a teacher in a rural community or a principal or a superintendent can be. Before I answer your question, I, I just want to mention the fact that we have to consider the high stakes accountability model and its impact on school period, but rural school in particular, as we consider this challenge, because that accountability model many years ago, decades, changed the way that rural schools saw their purpose. We now in rural schools believe that every ounce of energy we have has to be directed toward demonstrating gains and improvement on an assessment. And we were moved to lose the close connection that school had to community. And that really caused a separation that contributes to that notion of consolidation and taxing and, and contribution on a local level. So for, for us, for about six or eight years ago, we understood that and other data, and we launched what we called the Appalachian Renaissance Initiative that was really an effort to focus on personalized learning, developing local capacity, figuring out a way forward, and reconnecting school to community. And that effort has led us to be in a position to help folks implement a wide array of projects, programs, and initiatives that connect the school to the community, but also can demonstrate success on that accountability model and that assessment model. So let, let me just repeat back what I've heard here, because I think it's an important point to sort of put a pin in. I sort of expected you to say, well, you know, we have these districts and we need to do these big educational projects. So we get together and we do something that we can't do separately. But you're talking about a more holistic approach where you're saying, you know, we need to develop things that 
enable us to do things we couldn't necessarily do individually, but that also push back directly into our economy. Absolutely. A few months ago, we issued a, a report that we called a way forward. And it really took a look at the regional data, the demographic data for our region, minus education. Because too often, an examination of place focuses on a small county or a community, and it only looks at individual chunks of data. But we looked at trend data from unemployment to poverty level to obesity cancer rates, every data source that we could track together for our region, right. not one community, because too often the legislature can discount one small county because, well, that's, that's just that county that's tough there. But we looked at the whole nut right. of that region, and that trend data is incredibly alarming. For decades, we used the turn of the century is one waypoint in that examination. Within that period of time, from 2000 to present in February of this past year, our region had lost 11.4% of its population. The state as a whole had gained 10%, which mirrors the national trend. Rural areas are on the decline. Urban areas will increase. In addition to that, we have higher cancer rates, we have higher rates of obesity, higher rates of diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Educationally, we have lower rates of folks who live in our communities with bachelor's degrees or higher. However, within that same period of time, our high school graduation rate has continued to accelerate. We now grad we graduate 95% of our kids which is above the state average, above the national average. Those kids who do graduate, graduate at a higher rate of college and career readiness, according to the metrics our state uses, than the rest of the state. We have higher attendance rates than the rest of the state, especially if we take out the last day of the month and the first two days of each month, because that's when people get their threshold checks, their, their food stamp check, their government Government check. assistance. Parents take kids to go shopping because that's a thing. That's what you do. But being able to look at all of that data in one collection, in a snapshot, sent an alarm to everyone who looks at the data and reads the report because it is a trend that is a downward spiral for a region. Our belief, however, is that we will focus on abundance, not scarcity. We have a fierce belief in the people who live where we are and a belief that we can be that catalytic driver to reinvent the place where we are so that people can thrive, not just survive or get by. If you think about Appalachia and think about an image that will come to your mind, it's usually going to be a black and white photograph or a current national news story of folks who live in a trailer, and it's hard scrabble times. That exists. There's no discounting right. that fact. But we also have incredibly talented kids who are creative and capable and able to look at their community, figure out a way to solve a pervasive problem. And when we couple that with committed teachers who are willing to say, we got to get potable water to the head of that holler. How can we work together as a class in this engineering STEM-associated project to figure out how to put water up there? Then those kids do really well on the test that we're held accountable for, and the community connects to them in ways that are amazing and important, and the kids then are doing something that's much bigger than themselves. Well, it's also interesting because you've got this unexpected turn. Right. I mean, you, you have some downward trends, you have some pressures, you have depopulation pressures, not a lot going well. Your student outcome numbers are higher than you would expect, given all those other factors. Help me out here. I mean, wh why is this the case? Usually this is not what we, we see. In urban environments, we often see the absolute flip of that coin. Urban schools struggle more, but the economic opportunities are sort of flooding in. And, you know, I'm just curious, what's the secret sauce in rural schools that give these bonus outcomes? Do you have a theory? I've always got a theory about everything. I think one of the reasons that 
schools in our region have been able to do that is because they have reconnected to the passion to be a teacher. And that connection to place is really profoundly important. We struggle to find teachers. In November, midway through last year, we still had 52 unfilled positions in our region, not because people had took the job and left, but because we had never been able to find a certified teacher to take that job. Yeah. So we make our own. And we know that if we have local kids that we can move toward being a teacher, they will be committed, they will be passionate, and they will stay. Now, it makes it difficult for us to hang on to them because when you're really a good teacher, other districts want you to come and work for them. And the other districts, as we said earlier, can pay more. But what we also know through our own research is that talent attracts talent. If we create schools where people feel engaged, they want to be there, teaching is something that's magic to them, and they know they're making a difference, they will stay there and work and be happy for less money. So for our schools, and, and it's not all Lake Wobegon, we still have lots of issues that sure. we struggle through all the time, but that connection to place, that interest in something that's bigger than just the test score, I think has really helped all of our districts, 156 schools, be able to figure out how they're going to move in a different way to be innovative, to be nimble, not to take forever to make a decision, but to innovate every day. And we're blessed that predominantly educators in our region really do believe strongly in where they are and the kids that they have, in spite of the challenges those kids come to school with every day, they want to make a difference. Could I just say two quick things about this? So for listeners who are interested in the notion of place and schooling or communitarianism in general, Wendell Berry, of course, is one of the classic sort of American writers and thinkers about this. And Paul Theobald is another, mm -hmm. focusing on education in particular, has a book called Teaching the Commons, where he's very interested in these issues as well, and all the many sort of unquantifiable benefits that come out of them. The other point I want to make quickly is that what Jeff is saying is one of the many ways that I think rural schools sort of sidestep a lot of the predictable debates about politics or policy, both maybe for better and worse. I remember when No Child Left Behind passed, there, there was one portion of that law which said that if districts were failing at, at their assessments, at their state assessments, they would have to replace the teachers, right? And they would have to put highly qualified teachers in front of students. Of course, for rural areas, this is very hard. They can't get any teachers right. sometimes. How could they possibly get a highly qualified one out of, you know, magically out of a hat? And the thing that happens, of course, predictably, is as soon as these laws are passed at the state or federal level, almost as a matter of course, rural districts are just immediately exempted from them. Which, on the one hand, if you, if you take these policies seriously, is a real problem. How can accountability possibly work if districts aren't going to be held accountable? But on the other hand, I think what Jeff's saying is that it also opens up this room for experimentation and local initiative that can yield many of the positive benefits that you're describing. So insofar as the accountability regime, I think we can now say has largely failed in mm -hmm. urban communities, rural communities might be pointing a way forward to say, let districts themselves determine teacher qualifications or let them work out what meaningful curriculum might look like. And on an emergency basis, they often do that anyway. Right. I mean, it, it, it's happening anyway, but I think we might as well just sort of endorse it as a normative good rather than a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about the role schools play retaining a community's resources in preventing the brain drain to the city, right? I mean, this is a challenge. If you do well in school, what are you going to do? You're going to go to, you know, a uh, top college and Washington, D.C. or New York or L.A. looks pretty attractive. From a school district in Kentucky or in rural Arizona, I got to think on the one hand, you certainly don't want to deny your students the opportunities that they want to take. On the other hand, if I'm those districts, I want those kids coming back. I want them coming home. Talk to me about this challenge. <laughs> How do schools interact with that? So I did my graduate work at the University of Wisconsin, and I was there just as Scott Walker was elected and passed Act 10. This is the, the act in Wisconsin that sort of gutted public sector unions. And so all these teachers flooded into the state capitol, 100,000 people occupying the capitol building. A lot of them were from rural areas. And it was really striking to me when they were there that largely what they were talking about was their benefits, you know, pensions, retirement, et cetera. 
And if you actually went back and went to their towns, one of my colleagues at Wisconsin named Kathy Kramer wrote a whole book called The Politics of Resentment, where basically she pointed out that if you go to these small towns in rural Wisconsin, the best paid people in town are the teachers. They're the only ones with any kind of benefits. And so you could forgive local people for being quite resentful of this and seeing their tax dollars going to prop up the the public servants in the town. And so I think what a lot of us are talking about here is basically how teachers, of course, do represent a respected profession and many communities value their teachers highly. And you're going to need to give them professional autonomy and and hopefully good benefits to retain them. But that's a two-edged sword. You don't want teachers to be seen as profiting at the expense of the local community, right? Or, Or being somehow aloof or distant from local people. And so I think all the positive things that Jeff's describing about you know, recruiting and retaining local kids as teachers is very important. The flip side of that is the teachers need to sort of recognize where they are and recognize the community good as part of their mission. It's not just about them and their retirement package. It's also about how they can actually support the local economy and support local kids. Some of the problems that we just think about as general problems for education take a special form or particular case in rural schools. Let's talk about poverty. I mean, poverty that we think of when we talk about schools is usually sort of this urban conception of poverty, but that's not what we've got, certainly not in Kentucky. Can you describe the challenge of poor students that rural schools face? Yeah, and and before I do, I'm I'm just going to point out this interesting anecdote. In 1964, President Johnson declared the war on poverty. At that time, two out of 10 Americans lived at or below the poverty level. A few months after he did that, in 1964, he came to Martin County, Kentucky, in Inez, and famously stood on the porch of Mr. Fletcher's house and reinforced that there was going to be an unconditional war on poverty. Fifty-five years later, three out of ten Americans in our region continue to live at or below the poverty level. In our area and in much of rural America, we have lost that war. It has been going on 55 years, and we are worse off than we were back in the day. So the difference in poverty in my part of rural America is access. Again, it's isolation. In some communities across the U.S., it is not too far for public transit to get you to a doctor or a library or have access to a robust internet connectivity service, broadband. In rural America, we have kids who are on a school bus for about an hour and a half every day. That's a distance that they have to move. There are limited opportunities for them to expand their education and their learning because they are disconnected from those things. Part of the other challenge that we face in much of in, in my region and in much of rural America is the diversification of employment opportunities within that community. You mentioned earlier that a lot of rural America is based on agriculture or extraction in one form or another. That becomes the driver for that economy at the expense of every other opportunity for employment. So when basically we follow a boom-bust cycle, we're currently in a bust. And I don't know that mineral extraction will ever come back. Not to get into the politics of it, but the economics of it will prevent coal from ever being the employer that it has been. In 2014, there were 13,000 folks in the eastern Kentucky coal fields where we are who were employed in mining. In November this past year, that had fallen to 3,452. Those jobs will never come back. I mean, it might go up to 4,000, but it's just going to cycle up and down. But that's a loss of 10,000 jobs in just a few years. 10,000 jobs. And that matters to the poverty that we're talking about. And we also, I think, should think about poverty is not just economic poverty. Poverty is also poverty of the spirit. And when we are in a situation, that provides very little hope for tomorrow being a better day, that causes lots of problems that 
help to contribute to addictive behavior, obesity, lack of exercise, lack of access to health care resources. It's a deadly spiral. So we try to really think about poverty in two ways. There is economic poverty and there's poverty of the spirit. We can have a great impact on the poverty of the spirit for our kids because school can be a place where they trust that tomorrow's going to be a better day because they have hope that it will. And if we provide those students and their teachers with agency so that they can affect what tomorrow will look like, that creates a sustainable environment where they can overcome that. And then we can work on the economic poverty. I mean, I guess the only things I would add is it's important to remember if people have images of family farms, the booms and busts of the 70s and 80s basically eliminated family farms right. in much of rural America. And so now, although it looks bucolic, what you're actually looking at is a huge corporate environment, right, where a few agribusinesses own most of the land or sublease it. Farmers are entirely dependent on these giant international conglomerates. And the opportunities for young people basically are in the service industries working at Taco Bell or in sort of a presage of the gig economy, long haul trucking or similar, you know, other opportunities where basically it's terrible hours, terrible for your health and no benefits. Not to mention that all of these various economies, whether it's trucking or coal mining or farming, are some of the most dangerous jobs out there physically. And so I think for a lot of rural Americans, when we see things like the op opioid crisis, there are physical reasons for these things, and it's not just poverty of the spirit. It's also physical injury and, and as you're saying, lack of money and lack of opportunity. Yeah, it's also Absolutely. interesting and a little bit scary to note that long-haul trucking is one of these industries that can sort of be served by the rural population, and it's also one of those that may be most vulnerable in the next decade to automation. Wow, we've gotten to sort of a low point, but I also want to bring us back before we leave on some of the assets that rural schools are. Jeff, you've mentioned this several times, but I want to just come back to it that the rural schools are, they're doing well in terms of outcomes. Broadly speaking, there's variability, of course, but good graduation rates, pretty good test scores. But there's some other markers that are there. And some of those and some of the work that I've done shows that parental involvement in rural schools is higher than in any other kind of school or in any other region. And that is despite the fact that those parents live further away from these schools. I mean, just sort of by definition. So, you know, I think that it's interesting that a school can have a place in a rural community that enjoys just more importance than it does in more densely populated areas that just have maybe more institutions. I don't know if either of you have noticed these patterns or why they're important for rural communities, not just rural schools. I would say that in rural communities, school is the centerpiece. It's what people take pride in. You had mentioned earlier, or someone had mentioned earlier about consolidation failing because they couldn't agree on a mascot. That's right. Where I live, school is it, you know, and, and Friday night, everybody's going to be there for the ball game. It's a show. People gather in the parking lot. They have a time. And it's not just on Friday night, because school is also the only place in those towns that you can pull 50 people together to have a meeting or have, if you didn't want to do it at church, you can have a dinner. So school is the centerpiece. In every county where I am, the K-12 education is now the largest employer. That's where people are. So I think that also the folk who live in those communities graduated from those schools. For good or ill, that's either good or bad. If they had a really good experience, then they feel really good about that school and they want to be reconnected with it. If they had a bad experience, we have to change their mind and let them know that school is not that way anymore. But I think that for us, the school is the community. It is the identity. You're a cougar. You're a panther. You're a pirate. You're, you're whatever that mascot is. And you bleed that color. Part of the reason for that, we don't have professional sports teams. We don't have, I think there are three movie theaters in our region. So school is a place where you go. Sure. There's been a lot of work done in the last couple of decades about school climate and school culture and how 
these things can overcome a variety of ills, right? They, they improve academic outcomes, they improve parental involvement, et cetera. And because of that, in a lot of urban areas, people are kind of trying to gin these things up and, you know, make them up basically out of nothing. The advantage with rural areas is that you have the continuity where they're there sort of organically. There is a school culture. It's supposed to represent the community, and it does. And again, I think that's one of the reasons that you see some of these better outcomes. And I don't think it needs to turn necessarily on academic outcomes. I think some of these goods are just goods in and of themselves. It's good to know your neighbors. It's good to show up to the PTA meeting. And for those reasons, again, I think rural schools are a very important model that urban schools would do well to, to imitate or at least reflect seriously on. Yeah. I mean, I asked earlier, hey, why should we do a podcast on rural schools and rural education? And I think that, you know, we've sort of answered the question, hey, it may be worth talking about because those schools are so important for those communities. They are that central piece. And that's why they deserve an extra amount of attention, because a lot of these communities are facing some uphill battles on a number of fronts. It's good to know that schools can be such an important sort of bastion of these communities for them to rally around. And can I say one other thing? It's not just sports. We do entrepreneurial fairs every year, and it is amazing to see six or 800 parents and community members come out in the evening and tour students who have come up with a nimble solution to a complex problem and let them demonstrate what it is that they have come up with to be able to do. We had a couple of kids a few years ago where they lived, they trail rode with horses and they would come home late at night and it was always dangerous because they couldn't see the horse in front of them. So this young girl said, we need glow in the dark horseshoes. So she and her students and the teacher worked together and they figured out how to build horseshoes with the correct thing so that the horseshoes would glow in the dark. And they did it. Now those are being sold at Tractor Supply because it was a problem that they had that they wanted to come up with. And when she and her team demoed that in front of the community, when they came out to see it, these folks just went crazy because it was a brilliant idea. And we have kids who design and build tiny homes so that folks can live in them to solve the, the housing shortage, et cetera. But when the community comes and walks through a tiny house that you can peck on and you can see and kids built it, the community says, I knew we needed to train people to work with their hands and to do electricity and to do plumbing. And I've said it forever. And by golly, look what these kids have done. Yeah. The rallying point of a, a rural community is often the, the school. Well, Jeff Hawkins, Campbell Scrivener, thanks for coming on the report card to talk about rural education. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Report Card with Nat Malkus, and special thanks to our guests, Jeff Hawkins and Campbell Scribner. Of course, this episode wouldn't have been possible without our team of producers. That includes Sophia Gallo, Lexi West, Hannah Warren, Macy Heath, and Gage Hurley. You can subscribe to The Report Card on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast player. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or Google. It helps other folks hear about the show. If you have comments, questions, or topic suggestions for future episodes, reach out to us at ed.podcast at AEI.org. And until next time, I'm Nat Malkus. Mm-hmm.